start an orphanage myself. And then three hours after I received that text message on my cell phone, Brittany, along with 300,000 other people, were killed instantly in that Haiti earthquake. And I know it probably sounds strange, but Lynn and I feel very blessed that we have that text message. That text message, along with our son Bernie and Richie, that's the reason that we get out of bed every day. It's to make Brittany's last wish come true. And thanks to people like the Whipples, the Rubios, and all of you here tonight, we get to keep Brittany's spirit alive. We get to make her last wish come true. And just know from the bottom of our hearts how grateful we are to each and every one of you and what a difference all of you are making. Um, I'm proud to say that we have made Brittany's last wish come true. Um, a year ago, January, we had the dedication down in Haiti. And as of today, we have 45 beautiful children, uh, 20 girls and 25 boys. And so um, it's been quite a journey. Thousands and thousands of people, literally from around the world, have made this possible. But I will tell you, um, the one person that has really forged it all the way through and would have gotten it done no matter if no one had helped um, is Britt's dad, Len. And so I'm really proud to introduce Britt's dad and um, Len, and I just want to thank you all again. So thank you, and here's Britt's dad. Hey! <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. So. Britt and I used to talk Southern when we came down here, so I love it. I know we parked the car in Harvard Yard, so thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, you know, January 12, 2010, our lives changed forever. And uh, 300,000 people perished in 20 seconds. 36 hours after the quake, I received a phone call from Dr. Phil Reardon at 9.30 in the morning. It was a Thursday morning. And he said, Len, I want to speak clearly, and I want you to listen. He said, we have you, Brittany. She's on a helicopter, along with the three other girls missing. And we're bringing them to Port-au-Prince Airport. I want you to get down to Fort Lauderdale tonight, and I promise you, by 11 p.m., you'll have your daughter in your arms. And being the youngest of eight children, 33 in our immediate family, I mean, literally, the celebration began. And they, they, they broke into every news station in Boston. Brittany Gangle's been found. You know, it was just jubilation. And we, and we flew down to Fort Lauderdale that night and just <clears throat> walked into Lynn University. And the pandemonium that was going on in the morning as the president and his cabinet walked down the stairs and I could see the red in their eye, I knew something had happened. And the president looked at us and said, I am so sorry, we had bad intel, we had the wrong girls. And to lose a child is every parent's worst nightmare, and I know some of you here have. But to lose your daughter twice in 48 hours is just unfathomable. And as Cheryl Ann said, Brittany left us a gift. You see, she knew, she knew that we would not be able to go on without something, and that something was that text message. And that text message was very clear. The children love us so much, and they're all so happy. The people work so hard to get nowhere, yet they're all so appreciative. I want to move here and start an orphanage myself. And that sense of purpose, that gift, gave us something to put our heartache, our pain, our suffering, but our love and our faith and that is truly what we did. And not only did we do it, but people not only across America, those of you may have remembered, we were on the news for like 10 days straight, nationally and internationally. And it took 33 days to recover Britt's body. She was the last of the six from Lynn University who perished. And we felt such a blessing that we were able to get her body recovered and get her home for a proper Christian burial. As crazy as that may sound, that was a blessing to us. And then something amazing happened. People out of nowhere just started sending money. And within two months, we had a quarter of a million dollars. And they were just very simple notes on the checks. Build her orphanage. You can do this. And we did. You see, 
we went down to Grand Guave, Haiti, where Britt was supposed to travel the day after the earthquake in September of 2010. We walked up a mountain, landed on a plateau, and it was the perfect spot. For just one second, you can stand there and look above the poverty. And when you do, you realize how beautiful Haiti is. Because Haiti is a paradox. Haiti is one of the most beautifulest countries when you fly in and see the mountains, as that book was written by Paul Fama, Mountain Beyond Mountains, and you see this beauty. Yet when you land on the ground, poverty is everywhere. There's no relief from the poverty. And when I landed, there was two million people living in tents, living out of five-gallon buckets for water, and for bathroom, because there's no sewer and water in port au -Prince. Six million people living there. It was unfathomable what I saw. But yet, the people were so happy. And that was unbelievable. The culture, I love Haitian people. They are the most caring, lovingest, faithful people you will meet. Yet there's danger around every corner because desperation makes good people do bad things. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was our life. We bought land in September of 2010. I did an evaluation of what we would need for tools. We bought a box truck that had a dual cab, and we put out there in the news that we were going to build this orphanage. And all of a sudden, we had every tool we needed times two. And we had to get through the first holiday without our bread. And it was Thanksgiving. And our two boys and my wife and I drove that box truck from Boston, Mass., to Washington, D.C. And we stopped and met with our congressman that took me into Haiti 10 days after the quake, and we met with the Haitian ambassador, and he tried shaking me down in the congressman's office. I knew I was in trouble. And yet, I moved on, and we moved on, and we came right here. We came right to Greenville, Thanksgiving Day, and celebrated a beautiful dinner with our dear friends, Gus and Belinda and got up the next morning and drove down to Miami, and we dropped that truck off. On December 23rd, 2010, Gama Ferrison, my son Bernie, and my nephew Ross traveled to Grand Guave, Haiti. And I have to tell you, it took almost four hours in traffic to get there, but we got there, and we set up camp, and we stayed there for three weeks setting up that camp. And then over the next two years, 39 trips later, 20 trips in 2011, 19 trips in 2012, we finished Brits Orphanage. And 70 of us flew in from Boston, New York, and Miami, and had a dedication weekend. And what a time that was. And then on January 21st, 2013, our daughter Brits, 23rd birthday, our first little boy came into Brits Orphanage. Kervin's Shasha, three years old, a little peanut of a boy. His brings him in. And I bend down and I say to him, come on, ye, which is how are you? And he looks at me and he says, when grand goo, when grand goo, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And we gave him a little cracker and something to eat and fell in love. And when I say fell in love, it was love at first sight. But what a bittersweet and overwhelming feeling to have this text message on my wife's phone and to have this little child come here and start to move. Not only was his life going to change forever, but ours was too. And that's truly what happened in Haiti. And then over the next year, with the help of Jonathan Lemire, who's here, our program director, who is an MSW from Tulane University, did his thesis in Rwanda on orphan intake, and Gama Perison, who's a Haitian-American, who ran our building site as clerk of the works, and now is our Haiti director. These two guys put together a great year with our USA director, and my wife and I would travel once a month down to Haiti. And we brought 33 kids in the first year, and we stopped because we designed the orphanage for 66 children, 33 boys and 33 girls. We designed it with six missionary rooms, which we call our missionaries, 
Brishinaries. And the difference between a missionary and a Brishinary, in honor of our daughter Britt, is you can have one or two glasses of wine at night at Be Like Brett. So, so that truly is what we do and what we did. And then we started bringing more children in this year. I've made seven. We came out of Haiti on Tuesday and flew into Fort Lauderdale, met with the president of Lynn University because we have something going with them, and then on to Charlotte yesterday and met Ben and Benny, and God bless them for having this wonderful event. And our dear friends, God and Linda. And we just have been blessed. And what I mean by that is, and I'll give you an example, Gus, Belinda, Lauren, Nick, and Gabe, and Jody, I mean, they donate a nanotechnology water filter. Now, water to you is going to put on the faucet. Water to a Haitian is traveling anywhere from 100 feet to a mile, maybe two to get water. Put it in a five-gallon bucket, put it on their head. We give out at Be Like Brit every single day from 3 to 5 p.m. a thousand gallons of clean, purified water to the people of the mountain because of Gus and Belinda Rubio. Let's hear it for them. And so now people say, tell us about the orphanage. And I'd love to tell you about the orphanage. But it's not about Brittany, it's about her legacy, but it's not about Brittany, it's about Myrna, it's about Lubins, it's about Delandia, it's about Shashuna, it's about the 45 children that came from such abject poverty you can't fathom, because I couldn't fathom what I walked into. You can't fathom it, but the blessings they have and our goal is very clear, and our mission is very clear. It was to build a sustainable orphanage where children can grow, learn, and thrive. Our goal is to, to raise the next generation of Christian leadership in Haiti. That is our goal. It's very clear. We're not an adoptive orphanage. It's about leadership, and that's what we're committed to. We have PhDs that go down and give our caregivers training. We, we are educating these children who couldn't write their name because they never went to school. Because in Haiti, public education doesn't exist. If you can't have the money to go to school, you don't go. There's a 70% illiteracy rate in the country because of it. And this is the problem, lack of education. So this is what we're doing at Be Like Brit. We're not just building an orphanage, we're building a community. Many people ask us, what can we do to help the people of Haiti. Well, first and foremost, Cheryl Ann and I do not take a salary. So I want to make that very clear to everybody here. Everything we do, have, I retired at the end of 2012 after 30 years in the home building business, and I'm still building houses just in the country of Haiti for free and not here in the United States. And what we do is we have our missionaries that we call Brishinaries come down for a week. And we actually go out onto the mountain where people are still living in tents, in shelters, and we're building earthquake-proof concrete houses. For $8,500, we can build a 12-foot by 24-foot two-room house that is earthquake-proof, metal trusses, metal roof, it protects them from the just horrendous tropical rains that hit there from May through October. And this is what we're doing. On top of that, we are <coughs> putting solar panels on our roof so that we can be financially sustainable. We're spending almost four to $5,000 a month on electricity and diesel fuel to run the generators. So our goal is to put 60 panels on the roof and to get the inverters and the battery backup and be off the grid. We're also just brought eight children in from just horrific situations. And those eight children are experiencing life as children, truly, for the first time. And just to share with you, uh, our, our youngest, littlest one, Juvens, we have to teach them how to use the bathroom. We have to teach them 
how to take a shower. And I ran in to go to the bathroom. I think it was uh, Saturday or Sunday. And he's in there learning how to take a shower. He was having more fun than you guys could ever imagine. You know, and I just was so happy to witness that for the one or two seconds that I saw him. And, and this is what it's all about for us. So we have these eight children, Sandiana and her brother Kervins. We have Luvins, Jubins, Sophia, Sofiana. I call her Sophie. <laughs> and we have uh, Mari, Mari Lodi, right, John? Lodi, yeah. Okay. And, you know, we have these eight children. And our cost is 400 a month for $4,800 uh, $4, a year to educate them, to give them a medical uh, workup the entire year. Every one of these kids that come into the orphanage, the first thing we have to do is deworm them. They have worms. That's how bad it is. And that's the first thing Jonathan does when they come into the orphanage. And, and that's the start of changing their lives. We, we believe in a holistic education. We are an ecumenical orphanage. My wife and I consider ourselves Christians and we're Catholic. Yet we work with a pastor that's evangelical. And he's our partner in Haiti, Lex Edmund. And right now... We are looking at the bottom of our hill to purchase a piece of land where we can build a vocational school. So I'm not leaving Haiti. I'm not done building because our five to ten year goals are to build a luxury hotel so that we can bring people to Haiti, have them experience Haiti, and then be able to go back and relax at night. And that's our goal. And this is how we're going to teach our children in the orphanage. This is how we're going to create economy. And this is our lifelong commitment to Haiti. So those are the things that we're doing at Be Like Bread. And I know, I know some of you have the desire to start an endowment fund for Be Like Bread. I can tell as I look out. <laughs> I'm just trying to be funny. But that's something that we need to do. And we need to start an endowment fund because when my wife and I leave this earth, our two sons, we do not want to leave that financial burden. So what we, what our goal is, is to raise a million dollars so that we can obtain Brits Orphanage. So our 66 children have by this year get the best education money can buy. We'll get a strong faith in God we'll get proper medical care in our 1150 square foot medical clinic. I could go on and on and on, and I, I appreciate your graciousness for listening, but truly, that is what we're doing in Haiti. Angela from the Greenville News spoke to me yesterday. I hadn't spoken to her in four years. And she said to me, she said, Len, when I talked to you four years ago, you were just heading to Haiti in that truck. She goes, what did you experience? What was the most amazing thing that you didn't think was going to happen that happened? And I smiled. And I just pondered for about a second. And I said, Angela, I thought I was going to Haiti to help Haiti. What I didn't realize that Haiti was going to save me. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you for coming. And we would do one on one here. And uh, thanks so much. God bless you.